Hello, CLC family. Welcome back to our series called Churches Got Gifts. My name is Chris Wolf. Last week, we looked at 1 Corinthians 14, the first 25 verses of that chapter. And that's where Paul laid out his argument about the fact that the gift of prophecy outranks the gift of speaking in tongues. Now, remember, the Corinthian church was so focused on whether or not they could speak in tongues. And Paul didn't have anything against the gift of speaking in tongues. In fact, he had it himself. But he did take issue with the way in which the Corinthian church was using that gift, the, the, their mindset with regards to that gift. He even called them children in, in the way they were treating one another with regards to that gift. Paul wanted to remind them that the gifts of the Spirit are meant to build up the body of believers. They're not meant to draw attention to yourself. And that's what they were doing with the, with the gift of tongues. It was all about them. And it was all about excluding other people who didn't have the same gift that they had. Paul just wanted to refocus their mindset and, and get them thinking about gifts like the gift of prophecy, where they're all discussing uh, the truths of God's Word. It would draw them together not only as a community of believers, but also draw them closer to the Lord. Well, Paul isn't done taking this church to task with regards to spiritual gifts. We're going to look at the rest of chapter 14. It's verses 26 through 40. And again, just like last week, I'm just going to pull out a few verses that kind of give a summary of what Paul is, is trying to teach this Corinthian church. So let's get started. Let's look at verse 26. He says, when, what then shall we say, brothers and sisters, when you come together, each of you has a hymn or a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation? Everything must be done so that the church may be built up. Well, let me remind you the context of, of where this verse is coming into play. In the verses just prior, Paul is talking about when visitors come to their congregation and visit and, and maybe are, are just inquiring about the faith. He said, if you're all speaking in a foreign language, they're going to think you're nuts and they're not going to get anything out of the service. But if you're speaking in prophecy, their hearts can be convicted by the Holy Spirit. They can see uh, the truth of God's word and they're going to leave there saying God is really in this place. And so now Paul says, and there's a little bit of sarcasm in this opening question. He's like, uh, but what can we say is really going on in your congregation? Because it ain't that. People aren't coming in and going, oh my goodness, uh, the presence of God is here. No. Instead, he, he really lays out what it was that, that was happening when their congregation would get together. What was happening is that people were coming together and they were all expressing their spiritual gift. For some, that was singing a song. For some, it was giving a revelation from God or giving a teaching or speaking in tongues or interpreting tongues. The problem was they're all doing it at the same time. And they have the same mindset that they have what, what he pointed out when he was talking specifically about the gift of tongues. It was all to bring attention to themselves. They, they were all trying to outdo each other. It, it was like a talent show and everybody's just going all at the same time. And they're all trying to get everybody else's attention. Can you imagine what that service must have looked like? The chaos, the disorder, just the noise of it all? each one trying to outdo the other person. Paul says at the end of this verse, everything needs to be done so that the church may be built up. Not you as individuals, that the church, the body of believers is built up. And so then he goes on to instruct, him what, instruct them what that looks like. And he starts with talking about the gift of tongues. And I love that Paul chose to do this, even though he had just spent several verses explaining to them that prophecy outranks tongues. He knows that this is their heart, that they love speaking in tongues. Okay, let me tell you how to do it. And what he says to them is that only two or three people should speak in tongues and they should do so one at a time. Imagine that. And they also, also should do so with an interpreter so that the whole body would benefit from what's being said. Then he talks about how the gift of prophecy should, should look like it within the group setting. And it was the same ideas. It's the same thing. Hey, only two or three people, no more. And, and they should do it one at a time. Again, brilliant. <laughs> and 
that the rest of the congregation should be listening carefully to what is being said, that they're not just paying attention to the person, but they're paying attention to the words that are being spoken. And he, he even mentioned discernment, so that those with the gift of discernment are listening carefully and, and tuning in to make sure that this is the word of the Spirit that's coming through, and, and not just someone's opinion. So he gives them instruction on what those two gifts are to look like. And then he goes in verses 32 to 33. He says, the spirits of prophet, the spirits of prophets are subject to the control of prophets. For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace, as in all congregations of the Lord's people. So what, what commentators believe Paul is doing here is kind of staving off an argument from the Corinthian church. They believe that that argument would be, well, hey, Paul, it's all fine and dandy that you want us to have order within the, the, the church, that that's, the, that's God's way. But, you know, when the Holy Spirit comes, we just can't help ourselves. He just takes over and then you just never know what's going to happen. Paul is saying, no, that's not true. That's not how the Spirit of God works. You see, there were heathen priests and priestesses in the, the culture that surrounded this Corinthian church. And they would have these uh, moments where they would be taken over by a spirit. It wasn't the Holy Spirit. But they would uh, grunt and groan and shake and, and foam at the mouth and all these weird things would happen. Their bodies were literally being commandeered by these evil spirits. And Paul is saying, that's not how we operate. We have the Holy Spirit of God within us. And there is order in, in his spirit. That's who he is. He is a God of order, not a God of chaos. So don't give me the argument that, that, that the spirit just takes over and you have no control. You know, Paul talks about uh, the fruit of the spirit. And one of the fruits of the spirit is self-control. And I love what Paul is saying about how the Holy Spirit works through his spiritual gifts. It's a partnership with us. He doesn't just commandeer our bodies and take over our bodies. He invites us to work with him in allowing the gift that he's given us to be used. It's a beautiful thing, but it is a thing that has order and not disorder. The next two verses, we could spend probably an entire week going over, and they, they, they can set off a, a discussion that's going to take us way off track. So I'm going to just touch on them briefly. In verses 34 and 35 of this chapter, Paul calls out a specific group of people within that Corinthian church, and he instructs them to be quiet. He's talking about the women of the church. Now, in our 21st century, our reaction to that is, oh my gosh, you know, Paul is this bachelor who just hates women and he's a male chauvinist and all this. And that's not true. We've got to remember the context of what Paul is talking about here. And there's other places in scripture. In fact, in, in chapter 11, where Paul talks about women praying in, in the service and, and women prophesying in the service. So he is not anti-woman. Uh, what he is saying here he's talking about order within the church, right? That's what we've just been saying, that they can't come all, all come in and, and, and express their spiritual gift without any order, uh, without taking turns, all of that stuff. Well, apparently there were women in the church that were talking during the service. The, the word that he uses there is the, is the same idea of chattering. And it would be as though uh, if Pastor Wick were preaching and all of these conversations started er erupting while he's preaching. It's like it's distracting everybody else. Haven't you been in a service before where, where all of a sudden you hear a conversation that's going on? It's like, wait a minute, wait, you're distracted. Paul is saying, leave those, those, those theological discussions or that chatter to a discussion at home. It can't happen during the service. Again, this is all about order within the service, and it's all about uh, m respecting one another uh, within the service and thinking about each other. Then Paul goes on to say in verses 36 to 38, Or did the word of God originate with you? Or are you the only people it has reached? If anyone thinks they are a prophet or otherwise gifted by the Spirit, let them acknowledge that what I am writing to you is the Lord's command. But if anyone ignores this, 
they will themselves be ignored. So Paul again takes them to task. This is similar to what we saw last week when he started to call them childish. Paul is saying, you know what? You can give me every argument in the book, but you're not where the church started. In fact, the Corinthian church was one of the later, later of the early churches to be established. Paul is saying, you need to fall in line here. You know, just because you do it this way doesn't mean you get to develop your own brand of Christianity. We are representing the body of Christ, and you need to fall in line here. And he also pulls rank on them a little bit. He talks about uh, if they really have the same spirit of God that he has, and, and they claim to be a prophet, let's say, or have the gift of prophecy, then they know that what he is speaking is the truth. He's speaking God's word. He is the apostle of Jesus Christ, and, and he's speaking truth to them. Their spirits should confirm that. If they don't, if they're going to claim that what he's saying is not right or that they don't have to follow what he has to say, then they're on their own. If they want to claim that and, and, and they want to follow that ignorant path, then they're going to be accountable for that path. So he really takes them to task once again. And then he ends this chapter and really his whole discussion about spiritual gifts with the Corinthian church with these last two verses. He says, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, be eager to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues, but everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way. Now that verse 39 is a perfect summary of what we talked about last week, those first 25 verses. Paul is reminding them of the ranking that prophecy comes before speaking in tongues, but he's also saying, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You don't have to get rid of speaking in tongues. Just do it in the right way. And then he says, he summarizes this last portion of this chapter by saying, everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way. That word fitting is the idea of honorable, a, 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 a way that represents the body of Christ, the way that we are doing it, which is an honorable way, something that's fitting, uh, something that, that really honors who God is. And then that second word, orderly, it does mean order as opposed to disorder, but it's also a military term that Paul uses. And I love that he kind of touches on that idea of rank again. Uh, one of the, the, the bigger meanings of that word is the idea of lining something up in rank order. So he's saying, yes, there should be order to your services and uh, there should be respect in your services and things do have rank. Don't forget that. And I think he's referring not only to the rank of prophecy over the speaking in tongues, but I think he's also maybe uh, reflecting on the fact that he, as the apostle of Jesus Christ, has rank and authority over them and they need to respect that, that, that God himself is over all of them and they need to honor God's word, God's commands for their congregation. So this is how Paul ends his discussion about spiritual gifts to the Corinthian church. And what is it that we can take from these last several verses of chapter 14? Well, just like we said last week, I think we can be thankful that our church doesn't look like this Corinthian congregation did. But what a great reminder it is for us to be respectful of those that we are worshiping with. Uh, to keep in mind that our actions or reactions, even our expression of spiritual gifts, needs to be done uh, with the thought of others in mind. That it's not just about us. We're not the only person in that church service. That there's others around us and we don't want to do anything that will distract others from their worship experience. Well, that ends our discussion of spiritual gifts. But next week, I want to go back. We covered so much information over the last 11 weeks that I want to just do a brief recap of everything that we talked about. And then we'll finish out this series. So I hope you'll join me for that. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, what a great reminder you have given us to, to just remember that we're, when we're worshiping you, when we are in corporate worship, worship. What a privilege that is to worship with one another. Help us, Lord, to be keenly aware of things that we do that might be a distraction to others, Lord. Help us to think of others instead of ourselves and, and just create an environment that 
that is positive for everyone, that is, that is building up the church, even in our expression of gifts, Lord. May we be, be conscious of the fact that we have control over, over how that gift is used, that we get to partner with you, and that we want to do it to build each other up. Lord, I thank you for the great privilege it is to carry one of your spiritual gifts in this world. Help us to be open to sharing that gift and doing it under your guidance, doing it with love and doing it to build up the body of believers that we're a part of. Thank you for this study, Lord. Thank you for all that you've shown us. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thanks so much for joining me. I hope you'll join us next week for our recap. And then we'll be on to a new series. Thanks so much. God bless your week.